Well, good evening. It's good to have you all here, and glad we've been able to be here as we gather together to hear from God's Word. And no, it's a little late, but Happy New Year, and one of the reasons I wish you Happy New Year now is because when I wrote this sermon, it was last year when I wrote it, with anticipation to preach this on January 6th, or 2nd, excuse me, on January 2nd. But the Lord had other plans, because if you remember that Sunday, we had our first snow Sunday with snow and ice and sleet and bitter, bitter cold. And so God had other plans for his message. But that's what's great about God's word, is the message that he meant for that time, and then of course put upon my heart, is still relevant today, as his word is always relevant for us today, even though it was written many, many, many years ago, is still changing hearts applying to our lives now and convicting sinners of their sins and helping us grow. And that's the great thing. So no matter when you hear a sermon, whether it's a sermon that was written several hundred years ago or maybe just last week, it's still just as powerful as it was then as it is now. And that's what's great about God's Word. Will you join me in prayer as we dig into God's Word here? Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this evening that you've given to us. Lord, I do thank you for the sermon that you put upon my heart. And though it was written last year in anticipation to be preached in January, you knew what was going to happen. And as it was relevant for then, it is relevant for now. So Lord, be with us now as we look in Revelation at your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, as you, do, as you know, we do McChain reading as a church. And we just got done with the book of Revelation um, as we were getting ready to start in January. And so this sermon's actually going to be out of Revelation 21, which was that week's reading in there. So Revelation 21 is we're going to be at. And so when the new year approaches, we hear things like, new year, new me. That seems to be the new thing that's going on. Um, and many people make New Year's resolution. And if you've made one, that is okay. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I've made some, and some of my favorite in college was I made a resolution not to make any resolutions, which is a resolution. So it kind of feeds the purpose of that. But I don't know if you ever, that was like a big trend. I'm making no resolutions for my New Year's resolution. And people did that, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, a lot of people try out new things in the new year. Gym memberships go up because people want to be healthy, and we do a lot of new things. And a lot of people are yearning for new things, not just during the new year, but as, as new year approaches, we always anticipate and say, oh man, here comes a new year. I hope this is better than last year. I can't wait for the new year. This is going to be my year. And we always look for that new thing. But could that be because we as Christians and also as human beings know that this world is not as it should be and we're waiting for the new earth and the new heaven and the new creation to come. We, we sit in anticipation. The early church sat in anticipation when Jesus promised to come back. The churches, when John wrote these letters to them and talked about the new heaven, new earth, had that anticipation. If you remember, the disciples, after Jesus was showing how great he was, and then after his resurrection, they said, when are you going to deliver us from the Roman Empire and, and create the new Jerusalem, the new state? They couldn't wait for it either. They all were yearning for that new thing that new day that was coming. And we too, as Christians, cannot wait for the new to come when Jesus comes back and fixes this earth, fixes the heavens, and puts it back the way it should have been before the fall. Now, we do know that no matter how much we wait for new or no matter how much that we try New Year's resolutions, which again, they're not bad, there's a lot of good things, or go to the gym or whatever it is, we can't fix this fallen earth. No matter if our church was completely full and if everybody in Gallatin and Davies County went to a church, we still couldn't fix this earth. It would be glorious if everybody in Davies County went to churches throughout Jamesport and Winston and all the other little towns. It would be wonderful, but we cannot fix it. Only God can fix it himself, and one day he will. So we're going to look and start in Revelations chapter 21. We're going to be starting in verses 1 through 4. And again, you remember John is on the island of Patmos. He was sent there because he was a Christian and the Roman Empire did not like him preaching his message. So they sent him to this deserted slave colony island for him to work and hopefully he would die. And while he was there, God gave him a vision and a vision of that applied for, the day, for that day and for the future. And here as he's starting to wrap up this letter and he wrote to seven churches plus they passed on to many other churches 
he gets this vision of what is to come. And John writes, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. But what a glorious sight that John gets to see. And and his first point here, as he's anticipation of the perfect dwelling with God. We anticipate that. We can't wait for that. We can't wait for the day. And a lot of us, we always hope, as the early church did, that we would see this in our time, that we will see the second coming. And so the first thing we see here is John sees the new heaven and new earth coming down. Now, the word new here that is used is not like the word new that we understand. It's not like you went to the dealership and you bought a new car to replace your old one. No, the Greek word here. Kanos, for new, means a new thing that has never been seen before. So this new Jerusalem and new earth have never been seen before. We don't know what it looks like. John didn't even understand what it looks like. It's completely brand new. And it's gonna be something that God will create new and perfect. And we as Christians look forward to this. It's like children that can't wait for Christmas Day, or maybe you're one of those parents that can't wait for Christmas Day or your birthday or that thing you just can't wait for. We as Christians are like this. We cannot wait until all of creation is made new. We will see humans, animals, and earth like never before. We will see them in a perfection state. Think about that. The way you and I, we see each other, we see each other in a fallen state. All of us have some type of the fall upon us, whether it's from birth defects or scars or missing things or things that's not right. We will see everything in heaven brand new in a perfect state. The earth, as we look around the earth, we know it's not in a perfect state. Even if we cleaned up all the trash and all that, we can see the scars from the flood. We can see the scars from the damages of storms and and the world slowly eroding away. That won't be that way. It'll be completely brand new. Animals, we see them, we love them, and some we don't love, depending on what type of animal it is, and, and we see them, but they're not perfect either. It doesn't take much to look at animals and see how they interact with each other, that they're not perfect. Again, we will see them all in that perfect being. There will be no fallen state. Verses two and three point out, as you notice, they knew Jerusalem. This will not look like the old Jerusalem as we know of today, a fallen city that has been rebuilt many times. And to John, the Jerusalem there that was under Roman occupation that was, had been fallen and been burnt by Babylon and was getting ready before he wrote this letter or after he wrote this letter, then the temple would be burned by the Romans when they would take it over and had all this destruction happen again. This is even new to him. That's why he calls it the new Jerusalem. And it's something that we have not seen. It will be totally different. It will be the capital of God. This is where God will dwell, where we will dwell in it and be its citizens. This will be our city. Which also means since it's new, there will probably be no distinctions of borders. So it'll be like no Middle East and North America and all that. Notice it says there's no sea. So all the the continents are back together. and, And it's a different location. We don't know how it's gonna look. Um, it has been stated before by when scholars have studied it that the earth has been recreated because of how it has been in a fallen state. Plus, to take the new Jerusalem, the way that's been measured out in the Bible, would be, wouldn't be able to fit in our planet today the way it talks about in Revelation, the rest of Revelation here is the city. This is a new city. It's a huge city. We all get to be there. And what's great is God is dwelling with man and we are dwelling with him. There's no more void. Like right now, we have a void between us and God. We have to go through our mediator, Jesus Christ, to have a relationship with God. But we don't have God with us here on this earth in a sense that we can't see him, touch him, hear him. That will all change in the new Jerusalem. We will see God. We will be able to go and approach God and talk with him. 
We will hear his voice. We will be able to worship him, and there he'll be at. We don't have that today. There is a void between man and God right now because of the fallen state, but that will disappear. And it will finally be as it was supposed to be from the beginning. If you remember back in the Garden of Eden, man and God walked together. You remember Adam and Eve hid because they heard God walking in the garden. There was, now that doesn't mean that God had legs, it was actually taking steps, but they knew God's presence was there in the garden. They said, well, we can't be here with him. We're sinners, we gotta go hide now. They understood fully what was going on, but they had to go hide. That void that happened when both man and woman ate the forbidden fruit, they caused that separation. And even though Jesus was here on this earth, if you remember, when he entered his glorification state on the transfiguration, what happened? The disciples fell down. They couldn't stand before him. They couldn't stand before that God because he was so glorious. Their eyes couldn't behold it. But now we have a time when it will come or it's going to come when we will be able to be with God. We'll still worship him. We will understand that we are his creation. He is our God. We can be with him. And he goes on and talks about the new earth. And it's very hard to tell what all this is going to look like with the new earth, new city, because there's not much detail God gives to John. He doesn't give much detail. Many people have tried to speculate and write books and try to understand. And the thing is, we don't know, except it's going to be perfect without sin. We will finally see the full healing power of Jesus. We'll finally see the full power that Jesus did when he defeated sin on the cross. So we know that power by us being saved, but we still see sin today. We still see it in the news. We still see it in our communities. We still see it just from people getting sick, from common colds, to people passing away of old age. We still see it here. Even though sin was defeated on the cross and Jesus crushed the serpent's head when he rose from the grave and defeated all of that, we still see the marks of sin around here. But one day, all that is gone. One day, as it talks about here in verses four, where God will wipe away our tears. There's no longer needs to be mourning over sin. No longer needs to be mourning of the separation. No longer needs to be mourning of the separation of death. All our pain is gone. A lot of us who struggle with pain due to arthritis or other things when it goes warm, cold, warm, cold, as it seems to keep me doing here in Missouri, that yo-yo effect, it drives us nuts. It hurts us. And some people get pain so bad, we're bedridden. That is gone. Think of the people in the nursing home right now that are affected from pain and sickness, whether it's a physical sickness or a mental sickness. Those that are believers, that sickness will be gone in the new heaven, in the new earth here. And we will see that Jesus' full healing power will be in effect over our lives and over the lives of many other believers. He will be our conqueror and our Lord, and all things will be made right by him and through him. And what a glorious day that will be. Which moves us on to our second point, Jesus, our Savior and our Creator in Revelations 21, 5 through 8. And it says, and he who was seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. So here we see Jesus claims the title that we already know. He is the creator. Now, this is not the first time that Jesus creates. We know that he was in the the beginning with God, creating. We know he was there and that all things were made through him, as Philippians tells us. But again, God and him are working together, and he is creating the new earth and the new heavens. He is being a part of the creation. And notice what the title that Jesus claims. He is the Alpha and Omega. And this is a very important title because the other times that we see the Alpha and Omega or the beginning or end or first and last is in Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6. And this is actually God speaking to the prophet Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last. Besides me, there is no God. And again, in Isaiah 48, 12, God says, Listen to me, O Jacob and Israel, whom I call. I am he, I am the first, and I am the last. So we see here from the Old Testament and that the people of Israel would understand that God is the beginning and the end. Now Jesus here claims that same title. He is the beginning 
and the in. Jesus, again, is showing the Trinity, showing his deity to John. He is telling John, look, remember I told you all those times when I was walking the earth that I am God. Remember when Thomas says, show me the Father. And Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Anybody who knows the Father knows me. And I and the Father are one. And he goes on and shows his deity. Well, here again, he has shown it in Revelation. I am God and God is me. We are together. We are one. And also, then you'll get the separate the Trinity, three in one persons. And so he is showing, yeah, Jesus is showing he is equal to God and that he is the full deity of God. This isn't just some angel speaking to John. This isn't some lesser being speaking to John. This is God's son. This is God speaking to John, saying, I am going to create this. How come he has the power to do it? Jesus tells us also that he's gonna give us the living water. It might sound familiar because it's the same water that Jesus promised to the woman at the well in John 4, 13 through 14. And then also in John 7, 37 to 38, Jesus spoke of the water. And this is what Jesus says in John 7, 37 through 38. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So Jesus is reiterating this again, that he has the living water. He is reminding John, reminding the churches, reminding those that are gonna read this letter in the future, us being these people, those that come after us being those if Jesus does not come back, that he is the living water. So in verse six, what Jesus is talking about is eternal life. Any of those who drink of his living water will live again. Now, since the book of John is prophecy and Jesus is prophesying of what is to come, that means salvation has not yet departed. Salvation has not yet stopped. We do know that at some point people will stop getting saved. Jesus will come back and that will be it. It'll be done. No more salvation. And those that do not know him as Lord and Savior, it'll be a very scary time for them. But we who do will be celebrating. So he's making this promise that if you want to come to him, and it's not mean that we have to go find this living water like a, a going on like the holy quest and all that to find the cup and all that. No, the living water is faith in Jesus. If you notice when the woman at the well and she asked Jesus for this water, he didn't just give her water into a cup. Instead, he told her about salvation. And that is what he's doing. So it gives us hope that those who hear this message, there's still a chance for them to be saved from their sins. But they must put their faith in Jesus. They must believe in Jesus. And then they will drink of the living water. And he goes on, he says, the one who conquers, that might almost be mean sounding like Jesus is saying there is a work salvation, the one who conquers. Because to us, when we conquer something, usually it takes work, it takes effort. If it's a test, it takes a lot of mental work and studying. If it's working a job, if it's physical, it takes a lot of muscles. If an army conquers someone, they have to fight to take it. So what is Jesus meaning conquering? Well, it's not about work to conquer or overcome because we know Jesus talks to us in the scriptures and also in Revelation that it's through faith, but that we overcome our sin through faith in Jesus Christ. We have overcome death, not by our works, not by anything we've done, but through Christ, we have conquered death. As when Jesus died and rose again, he conquered death, and that's why we do baptism. We show that we're buried with Christ and that we rise again with Christ, that newness of life that is in us. We have conquered death, again, not by our works, but through Christ Jesus' victory, by his finished work on the cross. That's why we say it's by faith alone, through Christ alone, that we can overcome death, by faith alone in Christ through grace alone that comes through Christ. And then he tells that we will become sons of God. This echoes the first chapter of the Gospel of John where it talks about the children of God. But the only people who are the children of God are those who believe in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Not all of us are children of God as some teach. Not everyone you meet outside these walls are children of God. There's even people who come to church that are not fully children of God because they have not believed in Jesus Christ, their Lord and Savior. Not everyone is children of God. 
but only those with saving faith in Jesus. Which leads us to our third point. Not all will obtain the inheritance of God. And we see this in Revelation 21, 8. But as for the cowardly, the faithlessness, the destable, as for the murderers and the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. If you notice back before it's in verse seven, Jesus says, write this down. He told John specifically, write this down. You might be thinking, why would Jesus ask John to write this sad part down, this happy story? We just got new heaven, new earth, no more tears, no more death, no more sickness. Perfection is given, conquerors through Christ. (coughs) Excuse me. Why? Would God ruin anything in a happy story? It's a warning. Jesus knows that there's gonna be people reading this and he doesn't want them to go through life thinking they are okay. It is a warning that not everyone will obtain this inheritance. You see, when John wrote this letter, if you remember, there were some churches, it's like the church in Ephesus, that had left their first love of Laodicea. And, and God says, I, or Jesus says, I wish that you would be hot or cold. Pick one, but you're lukewarm. You've left your first love. You're following, as he goes on to different churches, you're following after Jezebel's teachings. You notice those seven churches, they had issues that Jesus was calling them back because they were leaving Jesus thinking they were okay. They were leaving the true teachings of the apostles, the true teachings of Paul and John and Peter, leading the teachings of Timothy, and say, hey, it's okay to follow the world. And Jesus giving a warning, you're not gonna make it if you don't follow after me. And what's sad is we do have to come to a realization, not all will be in heaven. Not everyone that we have met or going to meet will be in heaven with us. There will be those who are cast into hell who will not partake in the heavenly blessings. And Jesus is making that point. Not all of mankind will be saved. Jesus is showing that salvation is for those who truly believe and not all will be saved. That's the opposite of what we hear today. There's a lot of teaching out there from many different people that say everyone is going to make it to heaven. It doesn't matter what you believe. It's okay. It doesn't matter whether you're a Christian or a Buddhist or whatever. Everyone's gonna make it. Only the really, really bad people is God going to cast into hell. Or there's some that even say God wouldn't cast anybody into hell because he is a loving God and he wouldn't do that. But yet we see here, Jesus says that's not the case. That's not the the case with God. There are going to be those that get cast into hell because they have not believed, because they have lived a life full of sin and they will still have that void, that separation from God. Now, one thing to notice that this is the lake of fire, as we know as today is hell. And so it does not mean that those who have passed away without knowing Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, are okay. We do know that from the story of the rich young ruler, ruler, that they are in Hades in a place of torment. And one day, as you read on in Revelation, you find out that Hades and death give up their dead. They are judged and thrown into the lake of fire. Now, this is for those who do not believe. And this is the second death that will happen to them. This is the second death that is saying, the final judgment, it is over. And the sad part about this is those that have suffered and said, hey, I reject God now, they don't get a second chance. That's why it's so important. That's why it was so important. Jesus said, warn them, John. Let them know what is coming so that they can have time to repent because that's what's so gracious about Jesus. You can be a terrible person, as we've seen with the thief upon the cross, and his last few minutes of his life, what did he do? He looked to Jesus after he mocked Jesus. You remember at first in the, in the Gospels, it tells us that he did mock Jesus. Then he had a heart change, and then he stood up for Jesus, and then he put his faith in Jesus by saying, remember me when you're in paradise. What a simple plea, but what a saving faith. It's one of the most wonderful pleas that you can find in the gospel is not somebody who did this long prayer, not somebody who did all this going to church, doing all this work, but said, remember me when you're in paradise. And Jesus has promised, today you shall be with me in paradise. 
And he understood. I mean, he even told the other thief, we're getting what we deserve. I did bad on this earth. I did something so bad that I have to be crucified. But he is innocent. That doesn't mean that he did not stop himself from humbling himself before Christ. So in conclusion, we as Christians should get really excited for the new kingdom, the new heavens and the new earth that is one day coming, that is one day going to come when the trumpet will blast, Christ will come back, set everything right, the dead in Christ will rise again, which is a glorious time, break free from that dead. And if we pass away as believers before Christ come back, it is great to know that, that we're not always, our bodies are always gonna be held in the ground. That one day we will be made new. One day we will break forth. As Jesus broke forth from the grave, we too will break forth. What a glorious day that way be. But take that joyous news and go tell others. Go tell those that are lost about the new heavens and the new earth that is coming because there's still punishment for those that are lost. So with the new year upon us, we've only been one month into the new year, use this message to help find hope in the darkness. Tell others about Jesus. Here in a few moments, we are going to pray, and on our supplication, we have prayer for the lost in our community and families. Don't just pray for them tonight, but pray for them daily. Don't just pray for them but find opportunities to tell them about Jesus. Find opportunities to share with them how Jesus has changed your life. That might be doing something that they're shocked that you do for them because they haven't treated you well, but you said, hey, I'm gonna treat you as Christ treated me. Maybe that means you're going to spend some extra time with them because they might be hard to spend some time with, but say, I'm gonna spend time with you. Or maybe it just says, hey, I just want you to know I'm, I'm praying for you. And might start up a conversation. And then they can ask, well, why are you praying for me? And you can give out the gospel of why you'd pray for it. It doesn't have to be long. It doesn't have to be this drawn out two hour debate. It can be very simple. But find time to pray for them. Use this message of the new heavens and the new earth that Jesus said is so important that people be warned about hell that is coming to write it down, John. But don't just focus on that. Focus on what is to come. We as believers, when it gets dark, when it gets sad, when this world begins to crush us due to turmoils, due to trials, remember that this is not the end. This is not the period at the end of the sentence, but the comma, the new heavens and the new earth. That's where it ends, that glorious day where we will spend eternity on the new heavens and on the new earth with Jesus Christ, our King, our Lord and Savior, where God is our Lord, and we get to see him face to face. What a glorious day that will be. Will you pray with me, church? Heavenly Father, we are so excited and cannot await the new heavens and new earth. And Lord, though you have us here on this earth at the time, let us not forget our mission, and that is to make disciples of all nations. And Lord, help us to continue to make disciples through evangelism, through the reading of your word, through the teaching of your word, through building each other up in fellowship. Lord, just help us to continue to make disciples so that one day when we are in heaven that we get to see many of our friends, many of our families there, many people who are just strangers, but we told them the gospel or we helped by telling someone else the gospel who went and told them the gospel. And so Lord, help us to continue to make disciples. And Lord, let us just use this message of time of hope that COVID is not the end of our world, that sickness is not the end of our world, that cancer is not the end of our world, that the political turmoil or the wars or everything else is going on is not the end of our world, but you have the final say. And you will recreate into a brand new, new heavens, new earth, that we get to worship you for eternity. We get to be with you for eternity. What a glorious day that will be. And Lord, also help us to continue to not gloss over those that are gonna be perishing if they do not know you, but look out for them, pray for them, and evangelize to them. In Jesus' name, amen.